for fun are you aware of in your experience an ex nonprofit that was doing fine and the national support changed things to ill effect, either what they were doing, how they were perceived by oh, others? Oh, I'm, I'm not off the top of my head. I'm sure I could come up with yeah examples. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, and some of those relate to overfunding. There are people, yeah. there's, there's a stream of thought that there is no such thing as overfunding. All nonprofits can handle any money they're given. Uh, I would say that's not particularly accurate. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I think the family and cultural traditions in many rural places have been set for generations. And if a national funder sanctions one nonprofit versus another one in a community, that kind of tips tips a lot of things. And yeah. and that that might be okay. Maybe it needed to be tipped, but yeah. It also could be disruptive where it's just more painful than uh positive. <laughs> right. Or I guess inefficient. There's a transaction cost that need be yes. Yeah. Somebody. I think that's another, yeah, I think that's another aspect of it. Yeah. And that is one way I'm trying to be cute here with you, Alan. That's one way to say there's a might be a conservatism, uh, non-ideological in this case. Uh about which a national funder is unaware with traditions and mores and histories and so uh, Is there sometimes a more ideologically driven ignorance of the conservatism as well? I'm thinking of progressive numerical people who want to you know, come in and make you prove you deserve the money. And, and, and that doesn't fit with the way in which Group X in rural America operates or is able to handle I I think that used to happen more. Yeah. I think I think more often now national funders and, and we 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 use the term national funders often now national funders work through national intermediaries who are doing the work. Yeah. Um so yeah they are they are they are selecting groups who often have a history of being progressive in one way or another. So they're they're in some ways that being particularly disruptive, uh, but they are you know they they are getting better at selecting groups that perhaps are are more consistent with whatever ideology the funder had in, in the first place. Yeah. yeah, which would figure given yeah they see their job. But okay, uh, yeah. tell me about the intermediaries. Are, they, are is that a good thing or a bad thing? Who are these intermediaries? Are they better? intermediaries? Yeah, they're they're in the rural space. There's probably been eight or ten or twelve births since the 2016 election. Yeah, um, and they're all national. They're funded by national funders in many cases. Um, they seemingly have similar names and similar bodies of work at times. And maybe working in similar communities, so it's. I think it's created a bit of a sense of confusion. Uh, what it does is lead people to believe, oh, there's a lot more rural philanthropy going on, so that must be good. And I would, I would you know, conjecture that um, more money, if it's not to the right people, right time, right way, is not necessarily good for rural America. More money is good, you know, given to the right people in the right circumstance, right? <laughs> Interesting. I want to grill you more on that, but okay. Well, uh, it, it, this too is really another version of the same question. Yeah. Uh, what is, I keep saying national, and I guess I kind of just mean big, but that might be yeah. the thing that. No, they're actually, they're actually not the same. We have now funders of over a billion dollars that, that are just serving rural communities. Yeah. Oh, State interesting. Based. Oh, okay. Or state based, yeah. Do you name three just for fun? Uh, yeah, uh, Patterson Family Foundation in Kansas and Missouri, mostly Kansas, a little bit of Missouri. That's over a billion dollars. They are rural only. Okay. Uh, Dogwood Health Trust in here in uh, my state and uh, based in Nashville, North Carolina, but services to eighteen counties. I like to say their service area is 17 and a half counties rural, half yeah. of one urban. Okay. Okay. They're, they're, they're well over a billion dollars. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me rephrase the question then. When a national foundation uh, wants to do rural philanthropy, 
mm-hmm. as a worldview. We don't need to name it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it they're doing wrong? What what what, uh, what can go wrong? What is most likely to go wrong if anything does? Uh, with an infusion of national money, the thing the thing that is most likely to go wrong is that uh, rural people, local rural people, will never see any of the money. Yeah, that it will be sucked up in these intermediaries and the intermediaries to the intermediaries. <laughs> that and, is yeah. interesting. Okay, do you yeah. know there's a analog to international grant making there as well? If I can. Oh, oh yeah, I'm I'm less familiar to that, but yeah, that the. You know, when when ex national funder says we are committing ten or twenty million dollars to rural America for this program, what is the chance that a, a particular rural county or even a we'll say a, in a state that's that's generally rural? You know, there's probably ten states that are you know profoundly rural, yeah, you know, without really any urban big urban area. Yeah. The chances that money will hit anyone local, that they will feel, oh, wow, we have really been able to take advantage of this renewed interest in rural from a national funder. The chance of that happening are very small. Yeah. You know, those I dollars think- are all dissipated in different ways and conferences and think tanks and on and on. And on. Yeah. How about mm-hmm. voting registration? It seems to me that I'm seeing more emails coming through saying, we're going to do rural voter registration. Is that? I have not seen much of that. I know a couple of groups who do that. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, it's it's taking place in six or eight states. It's nothing more than I think, you know, local groups would have been doing. I think it's more supportive of work that had been going on. I don't, I don't see it as anything um, fundamentally kind of shape-shifting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's gotten it's a, it's gotten quite a bit of attention the philanthropic media but yeah in the season we're in I get that yeah right okay what this is the final question actually unless you can yeah. think of one that I didn't ask that yeah. I should have said what does rural philanthropy need by which I mean I guess the grant recipients but that could also apply by the way to the grantors who who do it what what gaps need to be filled niches need to be you know uh yeah, we, and I, I've been saying this for years, and I, I think there's some momentum. We need to move away from this idea in rural philanthropy that I'm going to be an education funder, I'm a health funder, I'm an economic development funder. The way the way smaller and rural places work, both people and institutions are working across issues. So this idea that we're going to, you know, drive a best practice K through three reading <laughs> you know, kind of kind of doctrine. And that is the highest, best use of philanthropic dollar when, you know, the hospital's getting ready to close and, uh, you know, the roads are terrible and, uh, you know, there's no opportunities for after school care. No, we've got to be looking at places. I often use the, the phrase, you know, it's like place up, not program down. Mm-hmm. So the, the best rural philanthropy is place-based, is really cognizant of the history of places, the institutional stakeholders, the old families with money engages them, uh, but is not so issue specific, unless there is an urgent, you know, places have urgent issues all the time, but is really, really uh, representing this this larger sense of what the future of the place might be. Mm -hmm. And that's not just one issue. And that's not just recruiting an employer. That's not just, you know, whatever getting yeah. the roads fixed it's it's kind of people working across issues uh yeah. for the for the future across political divides um i'm i'm always saying you know contrary to some of the the media portrayals people in smaller rural places are not spending 100% of their time talking about the presidential election yeah they yeah. might be talking about uh, why that school is falling down, why you know no one is paying attention. That yeah. might be an issue, or you know uh, why how they can, can or can't afford certain youth sports or things. But they're not fixated on the national political scene. Yeah, it's funny when you describe that need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Make those observations. They also apply to central city neighborhoods and urban areas. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is what. 
uh, philanthropy, you know, has done a great job in the past on really elevating some good practice. I mean, I, I just think of some of the old Robert Wood Johnson Foundation work that, for example, really standardized and popularized the idea of adult daycare centers. You yeah. know, yes. that was foundation led or the development of the nurse practitioner profession. Mm -hmm. Incredibly powerful. Where would we be without that? Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, so just really important things. Um, so that I'm not saying that shouldn't go on, but this idea in rural that the single issue focus is the change maker. It's just not. And the worst philanthropy causes the limited number of leaders in a rural place to move from issue to issue to respond to funders. Okay. This year we're talking about, you know, the needs of uh, senior citizens. Now next year, because there's a funder around, we're going to really focus on early childhood. And then the next year, you know, we're going to focus on youth mental health. Yeah. It's like they only can focus on so many things at one time. But if we think about it as all of these pieces being interconnected, same families, multi-generational families. Um, I think we're learning a little bit from work in the opioid space about this. Yeah, it's really important people have, once they get out of opioid treatment, have a receptive community that they can live in. You know, perhaps that's drug free and about employment, but there's also issues around grandparents caring for grandchildren. There's issues around the healthcare system's capacity to deal with some of this. There's issues around you know, employer willingness to employ people. So just saying you're about opioid treatment just, just completely ignores the fact this is taking place in a perhaps a rural community of 2,500 or 5,000 people that is under-resourced for everything they do, yeah. but uh, is not going to move ahead with the opioid issue by just getting more people into treatment. There's a, there's a bigger world that funders need to be concerned with. Yeah, it's taking place in a place. <laughs> that is correct. That's exactly right. I, I think I've used that phrase before. <laughs> oh, all right, right, okay. Uh, well, unless you have anything to add, Alan Smart, I uh, just want to thank you for doing this with us. And uh, anytime, we'll, yeah, we'll keep. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the uh, thoughtfulness of the questions. I think we don't talk enough about this rural uh, national funder disconnect. Mm -hmm. There, there have been people doing tremendous rural philanthropy for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And we only think about rural philanthropy when a small group of national funders say, we're going to focus on rural yeah. and, and, you know, X family and X place in South Carolina has given away $50 million over the last 30 years and really supported the whole perhaps social service infrastructure. Yeah. And it's like, no, there's no rural philanthropy happening unless X national funder says it is happening. Yeah. Uh, which I find both patronizing and insulting, but really shorting the possibilities of how national funders could be tremendous contributors. We don't have any funding for someone, for example, to support some really deep peer learning among rural funders and rural communities about what's working. Just take opioids or take youth mental health, both of which are really pressing in all rural places. Uh, you know, we don't have any real big ticket funding to talk about. Yeah. How, what is, what is scaling and evaluation look like for all this rural work? Yeah. Cause it's, it's gotta be different than the urban work. If you're only dealing with 200 people instead of 20,000 people. Yeah. What success look, all this stuff that would be great places for national funders to put money, but instead they are often taking the, and there's a branding aspect of this, I'm sure hey, we have just contributed $300,000 in X really remote rural place in Appalachia or the Delta or, you know, and that's not, that's not particularly, it's, it's such a small amount of money and it's not particularly contributory to building a field. And, and in fact, maybe disruptive to local funders. Yeah. There's, there's examples of that, but yeah. It's, you know, I could draw it up in a napkin if, if anyone wants to, you know, and I oh, have to, have to, have to, have to, to ask. Yeah. Okay, it could work or should work. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Good, uh, good talking. And yeah, stay in touch.